Oh, okay. I was going to record it, but Turhan got that. So we'll see if Tar can make a fiasco of this. He unfortunately didn't get to all to do all, all the research. He's only part way done. No worries. If anything, uh, I was just mentioning. If anything comes up about MC, I can help there. Uh oh, mercenary coalition. Yep, I was part of. Uh, I was part of MC while it was. Actually, Actually, just before the Delve War, and through it. Yeah, and so you can you can talk about Tortuga. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you know more about it than I do, but I don't mind helping out. Okay, Tar needs to get some tea, and he'll be back. Sounds good. All right, back. Well, take your time to get yourself sorted and then get started whenever you like. Okay. Um, there's one old co-ed post that Tar really wishes he could find. Mole's um, April Fool's FTAC T posts, if you remember those. I do. Unfortunately, I, I used to have bookmarks for them. Let me check. Tar has a output of the text saved, but not the URL. Yeah, I don't know if I still have those. Let me see. No. 
Unfortunately, I do not. Tar should be able to find it enough. He's got enough text. Since he's got the t text, he should be able to use Eve Search to find it. Yeah, most probably. Altar may look for it more when we get there, but he should probably get started and not let people die of boredom. Does it look like we have everybody in the room that we were zexed up in the chat? Yeah, I put out a notice into Alliance and everything as well, so I think that's what we're going to get. Damn, still wish Tar could find those posts, but he just does not have the URLs. Okay, um, something you might be able to answer for Tar. Um, not entirely sure how this um, chat was advertised. Uh, Braku put up a post on our forums as well as on our calendar. And... Uh, I've been mentioning for the last day or two. Yeah. All, all Tar's asking is, what was it stated that he was going to be talking oh, about? Oh, uh, here, I'll, he didn't put anything. He just put one line, and I'll read it to you. Okay. Let me grab this. Because I'm like, this was the least descriptive yeah. note no. ever. <laughs> Partially Tar's fault, he'll admit. Nah, no worries. Um... I like Eve history classes, so it's for me, I don't really care. Guest lecture on the ASCN conflict circa 2006 up to the first Delvor. Okay, okay. Um, that does kind of cover where Tar is going to be going, so I guess we will get started. Uh, Tar just wanted to make sure he at least had kind of the right idea of what he was going to be talking about. Um, so some background about the person who's of zero consequence who's talking to you. Um, Tar Palantir is Tar Palantir. He started playing Eve in uh, April of 2008. It's his character's birthday. Um, however, uh, he followed Eve for nearly two years via the forums and friends um, before he actually started playing. He had to wait until... Uh, CCP came out with a semi-working Mac client because Tar Palantir won't touch a Windows... Well, he'll touch a Windows machine, but he doesn't own one. So in spring of 2008, he started playing, but he is familiar with the SCN War, which is where we're going to start in the fall of 2006. Through the Great War, um, which is one of the nicknames for the Huge War, that covered pretty much three-quarters of Nullsec through most of 2007 which then ended in what is called the Delve War, or the Siege of Delve. The first one, there would be a second one, and perhaps even a third one, depending on how you want to count it. Um, so, Tar's going to make some general history comments first. History very much has points of view. 
um, and different people bring different points of view, and then some people bring very distinct ideologies and propaganda purposes. Um, Tar tries to pride himself on not doing propaganda. Um, obviously, you can believe him or not believe him as you see fit. But he definitely brings a point of view, um, just like anybody else. So Tar does not claim that everything he's talking, going to talk about is 100% accurate or he has all of the details and lots of it's going to be broad brushstrokes and stuff that he read. So if you go talk to the Mitanni, who was also around during this time and was involved in many of the events, well, at least the Great War in 2007, um, you'd probably get slightly different versions of how things happened. Um, as to why Tar refer to himself in the third person, that's what Tar Palantir does, and it's kind of normal for him. Though you'll find if you ever serve in fleets, especially in large fleets, more than two or three people, uh, so if you're a scout for those fleets, referring to yourself in the third person will make you below these. I means nothing in a fleet of 200. I'm in trouble. I'm at here. I'm over here. Doesn't do any, the FC any good. A name, seeing who you are, that matters. Because then they can warp to you. Or something along those lines. So, third person is actually useful for some purposes. For Tar Palantir, it's mostly because he's weird. So I guess, since I can't see your faces and see your facial expressions, um, Tar, we'll just get started. Um, the ASCN War, um, which is pretty much when Tar attention to um, Eve and Eve politics. At that time, Tar Palantir had a friend in Bob in Evolution, and he had a friend in ASCN uh, in the Corp um, R's... Celestis, I believe they were at that time. And Tar should actually give a background of who those parties were, shouldn't he? Um, Band of Brothers, affectionately known as Bob, were a pure military... Well, they were a military power. They were very military-focused. They were very PvP-focused. They were very arrogant, and that was quite intentional. Um, and they picked fights with about anybody that would come their way um, because they were interested in wars. Um, so they held at that time the, uh, regions of Fountain, um, Delve, Quirius, and Period Basis. There was another absolutely massive alliance in the same time. Well, actually, there were multiple other large alliances in that same time period. Um, one of them was, uh, Ascendant Frontier, or ASCN. They held a great deal of the central south, so Esoteria, Thabalus, um, Period, not Period Basis, Paragon Soul, and I think one more. Not entirely sure. I don't remember the political map exactly. Further west of them was a group called Lokita uh, Volera, or LV. They'll kick in in the story um, in about a year, year and a half. And then to the north, um, in the regions north, north, west, I believe they held Cloud Ring, uh, certainly Deccan, and maybe Branch. Um, somebody who was around at the time remembered D2. This is before the forming of the Northern Coalition. Um, and so they were kind of the major northern power. Uh, Morsis Mihi and uh, Razor both existed at this time. And if Tar remembers correctly, they had pretty good relations with D2. They will also kick in at the beginning of 2007. So that gets most of our players um, laid out, at least for the ASCN War. We'll start there and then move on into the Bob world, into the Great War of 2007. In the summer of 2006, um, Bob was intentionally picking a fight. They were looking for a big war, um, and they were intentionally taking belligerent acts, all kinds of other NullSec powers, trying to see who would 
kind of um, who would react to trigger a war with. So yeah, they were completely um, trying to bait one of the other major powers into a war. They actually, from what Tar has heard talking with some of the people at that time, they actually expected that power to be D2, um, that they would take it, but it ended up being ASCN that responded to uh, Bob's belligerent reaction actions. And so a massive war was started with ASCN rather than D2, and D2 um, chose to sit that one out. Um, jeez, there are... ASCN was a very large um, alliance. It was one of the largest in the game. I think D2 might have been larger in number of characters. They were a major um, industrial powerhouse. There's no question that they produced a lot of wealth. They built a large number of outposts and greatly expanded the outposts that were in southern Nullsec. Most of these Nullsec stations that we live out of and see on the map these days, of course, were all built by players, except for the original Conquerable stations. And ASCN was responsible for building a lot of outposts in the south back in 2006. Um, they were fairly welcoming of new corporations and industrials and uh, people, and they really saw themselves as setting up not quite a Providence-type world where it was uh, not red, don't shoot, but definitely meant to be welcoming and bring people in. And um, that's not really a description of Bob at all. And so ASN kind of spun it as a war of... Um, freedom-loving uh, capitalists against the Bob imperialist power and Bob being evil people and those kinds of things. And Bob, of course, spun it as ASCN being a paper tiger and not able to back up their claims with actual military might and know-how. Tar wishes he had had more time to go back and reread the stuff over the SCN War and the different battles. because He's got posts and other things that he's got recorded about different battles. That went. I'll just do the broad brush strokes. Um, the short version is ASCN got their ass kicked on a fairly regular basis. They were able to bring fairly large fleets, but the combination of the Bob F Bob tactics and doctrines, and then also um, much tighter knitting of their pilots um, and much more discipline in their fleets uh, seem to be the key to Bob consistently um destroying ASCN fleets. Um there were a fair number of accusations of um exploits and cheating that were thrown around. Um and some accusations of dev favoritism. Those things still go on today to some extent. Um but uh there weren't any particular proof of any of that. It is true that uh, Bob had a group of people who spent a lot of time um, learning the actual way EVE mechanics work, um, because EVE mechanics don't always work the way you expect them to, or even quite the way they were designed to, bumping mechanics, other things like that. And so figuring out exactly how that happens actually works in-game, and Sissy is invaluable for this, um, can be very valuable to a group of players. Um, hmm. Let's see. Uh, Tar can vaguely remember one battle, but uh, not enough to make it an interesting story. Basically, um, ASCN had some dreads out, and dreads were fairly rare and very expensive at back in this time. It was a big deal to be putting 10 dreads out in the field to hit a pass. And pauses controlled soft. Soft mechanics were completely different back then. Uh, it was controlled by how many pauses you had on how many moons in the solar system, and whoever held the majority got soft. So you were always attacking pauses. And so fielding dreads was one of the major shows of force because that's how you killed pauses quickly. And so 
when Bob was able to obliterate an ASCN battleship fleet and kill six to eight dreads in the process, that would be a major defeat for ASCN. Um, and that happened fairly often. Um, there was a huge forum war that went on on the main forum of the time, COAD, and then a couple of the other news sources, Eve Tribune, if you go back and look for some of the articles uh, from fall of 2006, you can find interviews with uh, Sir Mole um, for the Bob side. And then uh, usually John McCready um, and sometimes Cyvok, uh for the ASCN side as each side tried to spin the propaganda war to their favor. And both sides were very intentionally trying to spin the propaganda war. Bob very much had an internal... Um, they had a plan. There was a propaganda campaign and a design to it during that war. That isn't true of all the Bob Wars, but it was definitely true of the ASCN war. And let's see. Tar actually did find a few of the URLs he was... So one of the nicknames that Bob gave this war um, and into the Great War was the Pendulum Wars, and that was because of the theme of the Sir Mole posts that were up on the COAD forums. And here's the starting one. That's the one that Bob started the war out with. Um, and that was kind of the, okay, opening shots are being fired, here we come. Again, um, ASCN did take the offensive in the war at the start. Uh, they tried invading, if I, Tar remembers correctly, both Fountain and Quirius. Maybe a little bit into Paragon Soul. Don't remember exactly. Um, but Bob, in the end, did a pretty good job beating those off and destroying the fleets. Um, and so ASCN never made, um, never made significant inroads there. Uh, for a while, ASCN tried to do a two-front thing with some of their allies, so their allies doing an attack in Fountain while ASCN concentrated on the Quirius Paragon Soul front. Um, not Paragon Soul, period basis. They lived in Paragon Soul. Right, I, hope I always mix those two regions up. Yeah, period basis. So about a month into the war, um, Mole posted this update to COAD. And as you can see, Sir Mole posts back then um, triggered a great deal of um, responses, seeing as that one went up to 17 pages. Um, of course, in more modern times, they can get, well, I shouldn't say more modern times, in 2007 and 2008 and 2009, they could get even longer. Goons could certainly make threads a lot longer than that. But at this time, that was considered a huge thread. And now we get to a discussion of landmark. One of the big things that happened during the ASCN war is during the ASCN war, or maybe right before in the case of ASCN, is when the first Titans were built in game. Um, they had been introduced earlier that year, I believe in the summer patch, but it took time to gather the resources, and then, of course, it takes quite a number of days to actually build a Titan in your capital ship assembly arrays. Um, ASCN did successfully build the first Titan in the game. Uh, I believe it was an avatar flown by Cyvok. And um, 
Not sure which was the second one. I know um, the Evolution um, Avatar flown by Shrike for Bob was built very soon after the um, ASCN one. Heard that the D2 Titan was second. Um, don't really know, doesn't really matter, but D2 had a Titan very early and Evolution got one. And the Cyvox Titan and uh, the Titan flown by Shrike for uh, Bob with first two to see major combat. Back then, Titan Doomsdays were area of effect. They hit everything within 250 kilometers of the uh, Titan and five of them, but with most of the fittings back then, almost nothing did. So they were fleet destroyers and they would annihilate an entire fleet. Hicks didn't exist yet, and if Tar remembers correctly, did Dictors not exist yet, or did Dictors, Dictor Bubbles didn't affect Titans when they first came into the game? One of the two. Somebody who is actually in-game probably remembers that mechanic. But it was really, really, really hard to hold down. Uh, yeah, okay, Here. Eridolf says that he thinks that Dictor Bubbles didn't affect Titans early on, and I think that's what it is. I think Dictor Bubbles did exist during the ASCN War, but they didn't affect Titans. Um, so basically, the only way to hold down a Titan was for him to be stay there while you shot him, or um, to come up with some other mechanism that he wouldn't warp off or jump, uh, Sino jump out while you shot him. He had a good... Uh, to do that. And so both Titans, uh, Shrike and uh, Cyvox Titan, were mostly, it was about dodging their DDs because they would warp in and try, or Sino in and try and DD you, and you tried to get your fleet off, not die, and then come back to the field knowing that the Titan couldn't light another DD for 60 minutes. little thing that they eventually quickly took out of the game. Um, but Titans could DD through a Sino, so they didn't even have to be in the system. They could DD through a Sino just like they could jump to a Sino. Um, so that was pretty evil because it meant if a Sino went up the middle of your fleet, you had to get the hell out because there could be a Titan on the other end of it DDing you. That out reasonably quick because that was totally overpowered, horribly overpowered. I believe Tar did describe, but I'll do it again. Yeah, a Titan DD wasn't a beam. It was an area effect weapon and hit everything within a 250-kilometer radius of the Titan. Didn't matter if it was friend foe. Everything in that radius got hit. It was much like a gigantic smart bomb, except for it did a huge amount of damage in one blast. And for the most part, the way um, ships were fitted at that point in time and the way the game mechanics worked, basically nothing survived to Titan DD on grid. Things would change as fittings would change, but during the ASCN war, basically nothing survived to Titan DD. Or very little did, and then your fleet, which was not annihilated by the DD, just mopped them up. And so now we get to one of the big stories of the ASCN War, which is how the first Titan died. Um, Tar's not going to go into all the details. Um, there's a much more detailed post of it uh, that Tar's going to throw into the chat window. Uh, Titans could not destroy structures. DD only affected uh, ships, or if they even did damage to structures, which Tar doesn't think they did. Um, they didn't do enough damage to really matter back then. Um, not anti-structure weapons. Um, your anti-POS your anti weapon was, was dreads. You used dreads to destroy uh, pauses. Super carriers have also been introduced at this point, and they are also super rare. As Tar recalls, I don't think super. Uh, they were actually called motherships back then, and Tar doesn't think motherships played an important role in the ASC 
Korean War. They were around, but it was mostly carrier uh, for your capitals. It was mostly the carriers, dreads, two titans. That's it. Um, yes, um, the Titan, the I thought Tar mentioned that. Actually, I know Tar mentioned that earlier, but maybe he just got confusing on it. Um, ASCN built the first Titan. Uh, it was piloted by their their alliance leader, Cyvok. Name was the name of the Titan was Steve. And then Bob had one Titan that had been built by the corporation Evolution and was flown by Dr. Shrike. And so during that, that war, Bob fielded one Titan and ASCN fielded one Titan. Uh, there were certainly others that were in production, um, definitely on the Bob side, but Tar doesn't think any other Bob Titan saw combat during the ASCN war. I think that would wait till 2007 in the Great War. Yes, Steve dies, um, which is what this post is about. You don't have to read that right now. It's kind of long, but it gives all the details. Tar will give the short version. Um, the short version basically is that during a engagement, don't know the details of what the engagement was, um, the Cyvok let off a DD trying to kill the Bob fleet. I believe he did hurt, kill some people, but he didn't destroy the fleet. Safe spot. And he logged out before his 15-minute aggro timer was up. And so, since he logged out with aggression, because he fired a DD off, he did not, he emergency warped off, but he did not disappear from space, and a new 15-minute timer started, and he would disappear from space at the end of the, those 15 minutes. Um, a Bob Prober was active, noticed that there was a Titan on scan at a safe spot, asked, it was an avatar, and Shrike flew an avatar as well. Like, oh, Shrike, you're over here. And Shrike's like, no, not even in system. And they instantly got very, very, very busy, probed down the Titan, warped the, su the, the, cap the subcapital fleet air. I believe they signed in capitals. I believe there are dreads on the kill mail. And they killed the uh, first Titan in the game while it was logged out. The pilot had logged regression. Um, the caused a huge amount of commotion and a dispute on the forums, uh, accusations of cheating, Bob killing a logged out ship, blah, 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 blah. In the end, it would pretty much be documented that Cyvok made a mistake. He logged before his aggro timer was up, thereby starting a new 15-minute timer, and um, then uh, killed by Bob Fleet. As um, Kelly mentions um, Steve's wreck is still in space it's a monument it's a celestial object you can warp to uh, so if you're ever down there you can go look at it somebody else will have to look up the system name Tar doesn't know off the top of his head I believe it's in Paragon Soul or Esoteria um, they did that with the first Titans in the game that died I'm um, not sure how many I believe they did it with the first Shrike Titan that was killed Shrike by the way has lost a lot of titans. Evolution has done a lot of mining to replace them. Uh, I think they also put up a monument for the D2 titan that was lost. Not sure if they did it after that, after the first three, but for the first couple of titans that were killed in game, they put up those monuments. Um, there is a YouTube video clip out there somewhere. Um, if you do the right search, you can find it. Tar hasn't had time to pursue that one today. Um, but it was a, it's a short clip of comms as um, Steve explodes. So somebody on the Bob side was uh, frapsing that sequence.
It's a short little clip. It's only about 20 seconds long. Okay, and Keldon put in the system. It's probably also in Shrike's post um, that Tar linked earlier. Um, the death of Sh uh, Sarvok and the Titan really, in many people's opinion, it broke the, the spirit of ASCN. Uh, many people claimed at that point, decided that the propaganda and postings by ASCN and their claims of how they were doing were false, that they were purely propaganda with no backing in reality. Um, Cyvox soon stepped down as Alliance leader, and B Tar believes he retired from the game pretty much permanently soon after. Um, and it wasn't long before ASCN began to implode. Um, corporations began leaving in mass, players began leaving in mass, and not too long afterwards, I believe just about a month. Yeah, I during that month, um, for Christmas, uh, Bob made a mess of um, the uh, capital of the SCN Empire. I believe they may have even taken Sov in it by Christmas. And by January, it was all over. ASCN didn't hold Sov anywhere. And let's see, Tar has a couple of URLs for you for that. So that's Sir Moles' post in the 5th of January, basically declaring from Bob's point of view the end of the ASCN war, why they got started the war, what happened during the war, and how it ended. Um, again, it represents a Bob point of view, um, but that's there. There's another point of view that Tar found that he was going to throw on the forum, uh, th throw to you. Um, that was an article posted in uh, an article posted in Eve Tribune, which was a major news source uh, for the Eve universe back in 2006 and 2007. A lot of interviews and articles were written for it, and that was that person's take on um, the ASCN war and analysis of it. Um, since Tar read any of those articles. Um, so those are things you can take a look at and take your points of view on. Um, the ASCN war really leads directly into what Tar's about to get into. So are there any more questions over the ASCN conflict or from the other people who are old and were actually there, comments they want to throw in? <laughs> so another thing, uh, this is a lot longer, you'll have to piece it together because it's just some random blo blog postings by Bob CEO of the ASCN and early 2007 era, uh, Blacklight of BNC. Um, it's the front page, there are different blog posts in there at different points in time. Um, but there's uh, the thing that's nice about that blog, though, is that there are some recountings of very specific battles. So if there are things where you want to go look at how a particular battle during the ASCN war, there's at least one or two examples of that in there. Um, so further reading for those who are interested. Again, this all comes from a Bob point of view, so keep that in mind when you're reading. Um, doesn't look like we have too many other questions, so we can move right on into 2007 and the Great War.
Uh, okay, yeah, that's just mean. We'll get into the T20 incident um, because that actually helps trigger the Great War. Uh, and as to confirming that Steve wasn't cheating, killing somebody who's logged out is not cheating. Um, plenty of us have done it when you probe down somebody who logs up to save their ass. So, um, the ASCN war did several things. One, it greatly expanded Bob's size. They practically doubled in size and the number of regions they held. They successfully pissed a lot of corporations off. Um, members of uh, ASCN and also of ASCN's allies. Um, they both ticked off other people through their forum behavior, um, so that their and their arrogance, um, which were Tar will argue were very intentional. And there's also the whole fear factor. Um, the other Nullsec powers watched Bob in what was basically a one alliance versus one alliance. Yes, they both had some allies, but it was mostly Bob versus ASCN. And they wa watched Bob pretty much dismantle ASCN with very little effort. ASCN won very few large fleet battles, if any. Um pretty much never took in Bob territory, and Bob just rolled them up and tossed them away. Um, and that that matters. When you see a possible opponent um, destroy one of the other major powers, you get kind of nervous. Um, so combination of those factors kick in. And then if Tar remembers correctly, the T20 incident... Um, which he'll describe in a moment, but somebody who is around at the time, T20, is that really comes to the fore around January, February of 2007? That sound right to people? Tar doesn't remember when Kug, uh, Kugutman um, got his, his um, forum leaks posted. But was... Yeah, I think it was at the beginning of 2007, because it helps really galvanize the people involved in the Great War. And so the T-20 incident takes a bit of describing. Um, uh, uh, hmm. Was its mystique at its height? It was really high at this point, yes. Tar would probably argue that its mystique actually stayed pretty damn high up through the summer of 2007. And... It definitely declines in the fall of 2007, but to a certain extent it rebounds um, with the end of Delve War One or the Siege of Delve at the end of 2007, early 2008. So it's hard to say it's at its height, but this is definitely a high point. Um, because, yeah, they just dismantled with seemingly very little difficulty one of the major powers in the game at the time. Um, the T20 incident, um, there's a lot of different points of view on this. Um, Tar's point of view is informed by him um, being inside of uh, Bob, being associated with some of the people involved and how this all happened. Uh, some will claim that this just means Tar's been influenced by the propaganda and the lies. So, again, take everything with a grain of salt. Um, Essentially, uh, I guess we'll just make it the simplest form. So, there are developers who play the computer game. They play EVE because the only way you can develop the game and make it better is to play the game. Um, this has been true since EVE was in beta testing. Actually, it was true back when EVE was alpha testing. And it's always been true. They've generally kept their heads down. They try not to make it known um, that they're... CCP employees. Actually, as Tar recalls, they weren't supposed to make it public. It was supposed to be totally hidden. Um, there was a dev player in Bob and Tarsher. There was one in ASCN well um, in the corporation RKK or Rikuku. Uh, the character name, which is now famous, is T20. Um, 
He cheated. There's no question about that. He used his um, tools that he had access to as a developer to spawn a couple of items that were rare in the game. Um, Tech 2 BPOs had been introduced, I think, early to th- uh, sometime in 2005. Uh, somebody knows the chronology better, we'll know that. But they were basically handed out via lottery. It was an in game mechanic lottery, but basically, you researched, um, you got research agents, you built up research points, and every research point was a ticket in a lottery, and occasionally the lottery machine would roll and you might get a BPO, a Tech 2 BPO. Um, they were really, really valuable, and they allowed you to produce Tech 2 items. There was no invention at the time, so the only way to make Tech 2 items was to have access to a BPO or have access to a BPC made off of that BPO. Um, T20 um, created a couple of uh, Tech 2 ammo BPOs, and one, I think it was only one, um, Tech 2 ship BPO. I believe it was a Saber. And I think... Right, what Keldon has said is right. He wasn't cheating in the lottery. The lottery was just how it was supposed to happen. He used his powers to just create the item so that he had it. Um, and so that that's accurate. Um, and that was kind of what Tar was trying to describe. So sorry if he was uh, confusing on that point. So he then had these Teku BPOs. I believe he either gave them to friends in the corp or made them available to the corp. Um, and said basically that he had won them in the lottery. Or everybody assumed he had won them in the lottery. CCP apparently would catch this sometime... Um, sometime in 2006, uh, probably if Tar remembers correctly, um, from the dev, from the CCP postings, it was during summer of 2006, uh, CCP discovers this, um, and they find out that he's been doing this, um, but internally their own way, you don't fire T20, um, they don't make a public announcement about it. They do end up talking to RKK, uh, Rikuku, because they want to remove the, the bad items from the game, the Tech 2 BPOs, or at least that's one option. And T20 isn't the guy who has them anymore. Other people in RKK now have them, so they pretty much have to approach the RKK leadership about removing them from the game. If Tar remember, understands correctly, they were removed from the game. But this means that the RKK leadership knows that the cheating happened. Um, RKK leadership does not publish that to the game, and CCP doesn't either. Um, whether you see that as a major failing on RKK's fault, complicity, etc., Tar's not going to pass judgment. Um, Tar will make the comment that the way the Bob people he has talked to saw it, this was CCP's place and job to talk about. It was their employee they their employee did the cheating and CCP discovered it and put in the remedies. So it was something that CCP should have published and publicized, not the Bob leadership. Again, there are people who disagree with that. Different discussion. Um, it then come in the start of two th- where we actually get to the war part and where this all matters is in early two thousand and seven. Um, a gentleman named Kugutsman. Um, gets access to the RKK forums. Um, again, the details of how this happened are a little disputed. The version that um, Tar is most familiar with and tends to put credence to, but again, can't prove squat, is it was a forum hack. It was actually breaking into the site and taking the stuff. It wasn't a spy alt. Um, it was using security holes in software to get a dump of the forums. 
He then published the stuff about the T20 cheating, and essentially all hell breaks loose on the forums. Um, Bob, as Tar mentioned, has long been accused of cheating and using exploits and having uh, the developers on their side. This um, event of cheating, which again, T20 did cheat, no question about that. Um, this is seen as proof that Bob does have that support, that they do um yeah and Keldun is correct um tar mentioned the summer thing but he didn't mention the holiday thing so yes much of ccp was on holiday when all of this came out and that from ccp has said that was part of the reason why they handled it badly um the and we'll get to some of the repercussions of it on the ccp end in a moment but the forums explained People are raged. Um, a lot of people think uh, accuse Bob and Bob leadership of being in the know and complicit with the cheating. This is also t- taken as proof that all the other accusations of cheating and developer support that allowed them all those great victories during the ASCN war are probably true because we have a documented case of cheating. Um, so the rest of the cheating might also be true. And this really, this really upsets large numbers of the player base, um, large amounts of NullSec, and about, at this point, Tar would say about three quarters of NullSec, um, Bob already, and Bob's already shooting at them, don't get Tar wrong, but they pretty much um, de facto bind together to try and crush Bob. So in the South, the major powers doing this be against all authorities, uh, a primarily Russian alliance at the time. IAC, uh, Intergalactic Alcoholics Conglomerate, or something like that. And then a major pow- a rising powerhouse, uh, which would be uh, nicknamed Warm. Uh, it's a combination of Red Alliance and Goon Swarm who have become friends out in the Eastern Drone regions and have been fighting a long war in 2006 with uh, Lokita Valera, or LV, in the um, southeast of Nullsec. And then the northern powers, uh, D2, Morsis Mihi, Razor, and some others, also get on board of the northern front. And they basically all go to war with Bob, and they all involve invade Bob space to tear down what they see as a corrupt empire. Um, before Tar gets the war too much, he is going to talk about some of the repercussions for CCP of the T20 incident. Um, the, C- the CSM is a direct result of the T20 incident. It is one of the things that CCP implements um, so that they have a player-based mechanism, a group of players who can be giving them feedback about how they're doing things, about where their efforts are, about If another T20 incident would ever come up, Tar is sure that they would go straight to the CSM and go, okay, this has happened. How should we handle this? You guys are our um, link to the player base. Um, The other thing is CCP begins formalizing an internal um, accountability group. Um, There's a name for those groups. Uh, police departments and military uh, police departments and stuff have them, but basically an internal internal affairs. Yes, um, CCP didn't really have a formal internal affairs group to deal with possible cheating by their employees and misbehavior by their employees. So they began developing that and having a mechanism that can check into accusations of uh, such um, misbehavior on the part of CCP employees. Also, um, Tar's pretty sure that a whole new set of rules and regulations for the devs get implemented. There's definitely a lot of pressure to get devs out of major NullSec alliances so that they get out of the politics and get out of the storm that that can be. Um, so there were there are a lot of impacts on CCP from this. And then we have this absolutely gigantic war that'll cover... Um, And apparently Keldum knows them better, far better than Tar does, so.
Though I think those first two were both true with T20. Tar could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure no, no, they didn't know he was a dev until it was revealed he had been cheating. Oh, hmm. Tar didn't realize that. He is mistaken. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it was definitely the case, especially for those who go back to the beta and the early days of EVE when it was first first released, CCP employees were much more active in the game and much more clear in the clear about who they were. And so you knew, oh yeah, that guy's a dev uh, because he's a CCP guy and he runs around in space. Um, that has definitely changed since then. And as Keldum mentioned, that uh, things have become more formalized. So before Tar gets off actually into uh, the Great War, does anybody want to ask anything else about the T20 incident or make comments about it? And Keldun's last comment, that definitely happened to Selene, who went from being the alliance leader of a fairly major alliance, mercenary coalition, to becoming um, small fry. Uh, no, he was not. Um, that was part of the reason for the outrage. When the incident was first found out in the summer of 2006, he was not terminated. He was disciplined internally. Exactly what that means, CCP. CCP doesn't like to talk about their internal um, business matters, and Tar has some sympathy for that. Um, but they did not terminate him. And then when the shitstorm happened eight months later, they weren't going to... They weren't going to change. They, they considered the decision made. It may have been the wrong decision made, but the decision had been made, and they weren't going to go back and fire him after having not fired him. So CCP's position that they presented was um, at uh, while it may have been the wrong decision, the decision had been made, and that's what was going to stand, and that they would just have to, in the future, handle such incidents differently. Yeah, the T20 incident is not the reason for invention. Invention um, was brought about because essentially, and it's a completely different story that Tar's not going to get into, um, because of the lottery system, because of the few number of T2 BPOs, and then certain parties' ability to... Um, gather to gather multiple of those BPOs in their hands. You basically had monopolies on T2 items because only a small number of people could manufacture it. Nobody else could. There was no other way anybody else in the game could manufacture them, so they could basically set prices. And so you had monopolies, and CCP decided that needed to end. And so invention was how they broke the monopoly. Um, so yeah, the game was very different before invention when it came to T2 items and how valuable they were and how important they were because look at the in-game stats on how good T2 items are compared to their, um, uh, Tech 1 variants. Especially when you include T2 ammo because of how the bonuses and the range and some of the other things. Um, but Tar is not going to go off on and on about T2 stuff, so he's going to go into the Great War. Um, and, geez, Tar's already been talking for an hour, and the Great War, and that only covered about six, five months. Um, the Great War, geez. Um, to start out with... Um, Bob was actually very, they were very busy, they loved it, um, and they were very successful. Uh, Bob turned back most of the invasions of their space. Um, it was not Bob 
alone Bob and their allies. Uh, Bob definitely hired Mercenary Coalition, which was a mercenary alliance of the time. Um, they entered into a major contract with Bob and became a major power um, in the war. Very, and they were an impressive group. They had a lot of, um, they had a very large cap fleet, which was unusual for the time period. Um, and they pretty much um, wiped the floor with their opponents. Uh, let's see. Tar has um, the mole posting starting out um, Bob's offensive against Goon Swarm and Red Alliance. And that post from Mole is pretty much Mole de, and Bob declaring war on most of the, on three quarters of Eve. Um, they went to the aid of uh, Lokita de Valera, um, headed by Chow Down, hence the Chow reference in that post, against the combination of Goon Swarm and Red Alliance. They were slowly being crushed. Um, and it had been a long war going on in 2006 while the ASCN war was going on. So it was a parallel war, but completely separate. Um, Bob did not end up saving LV. Um, LV ends up being crushed and imploding. Um, there's actually a fairly major battle to kill a um, LV Titan, which is in build. Um, won't get into all the mechanics details of how that fight went down, but in the end, Goon Swarm Red Alliance is able to kill the uh, Lokita Valera um, POS that had the Titan within a few days, if, if Tar remembers correctly, in a few hours, but it was very close to being built. And again, Titans are still amazingly powerful at this point in the game. Um, believe still don't think Dictor Bubbles affect them at the early part of the war. Um, Shrike dies in the early stages of this, I believe in February of 2007. Uh, she is caught by a Goon Swarm fleet, uh, Goon Swarm and Red Alliance fleet. Uh, they hold her in place by bouncing the bounce mechanics at the time. Basically, they keep on hitting her so that she can't warp out. Uh, can't remember why she couldn't Sino out. That part of the mechanics Tar doesn't remember. Um... Bob, of course, tries to save Shrike. There are fights all over the place, but in the end, Shrike dies. And so that's the second Titan to die in the game, is Shrike. And the first of Shrike's four Titan losses. Um, but even the death of Shrike doesn't really change the direction of the war. And Bob continues to expand across the south into LV space, pushing Goon Swarm and Red Alliance. Um, Iron Front is mostly handed over to Mercenary Coalition. Bob does help out on it, but... The coalition generally takes the northern front, and they just steamroll D2 um, and its allies, and they crush them time and time and time again. Um, Cloud Ring falls, Declan falls, Branch falls. Uh, D2 ends up resorting to pauses which are all hardeners. Their only point is to be a pain in the ass to reinforce and kill. Um, they were called D2 specials just to slow down the uh, mercenary coalition fleets. Um, but it doesn't save D2. D2 implodes. Yep. Uh, the remnants of D2 and some of their allies, basically they all end up rallying, I believe it was in tribute, right? Um, under the protection, all uh, Razor, Morsis Mihi, and a couple of others, all basically they build Fortress Tribute um, and hold on to that. But the entire rest of the North falls. I think even Tino falls to Mercenary Coalition. So yeah, they pretty much wipe everything from Cloud Ring over to Geminate, which those groups hold. Um, so that pretty much takes D2 out of the war. Um, in the north, and the northern front quiets down. Um, Mercenary Coalition and Bob put allies in the various regions. Mercenary Coalition is not interested in holding soft space, so they basically pull out. 
um, and Bob is not taking that space. Bob has expanded massively. If you uh, currently at its peak during the Great War, Bob holds everything from the south over by Omist, all the way around um, to Delve Fountain, up north through Cloud Ring, and then back over through Declan Branch. And uh, Tenal is all held by Bob or Bob allies. Yep. Uh, what uh, Erdolf has been saying about mercenary coalition. They, w they were a mercenary alliance and they were th uh, a couple of mercenary corporations that worked together, but they weren't um, Bob was a solid unified war machine. Mercenary coalition, less so. Um, they were mercenaries in the hire of Bob. And he knows far more about the insides of um, uh, mercenary coalition than Tar does. Um, t uh, Bob sets up, the, again, their allies. It's generally, um, the way Tar would describe the Bob um, Sov system was a feudal system. Um, you had other allies who were given soft space, they were given the responsibility for defending it. Yes, Bob Pets is what they were called, or Bobbits. Um, you were responsible for defending your space, maintaining it, taking care of it, um, and you were not required to go on Bob's wars, but if your space was invaded, you were expected to provide troops to defend it. Um, now, it's certainly true that the Bob allies, some of them liked going to war and did join the Bob war machine when they went out to to other areas, the alliance as a whole generally didn't. They generally stayed to their region. So again, a very feudal uh, Europe type system with one major military power at its core, which has conquered everything, um, and then setting up other people to actually run it and administer it. And then, yes, there were payments that you had to make as part of that um, that you owed to Bob. Um, Bob does have a lot of problems with um, its logistics chain at this time. Again, all their production is back in Delve. Um, that's where they make their ISK and their pilots live, etc. But they're fighting at the far edges of the southeast. Um, while Goons, Goon Swarm and Red Alliance are much closer to the front lines. The front lines actually at one point get within a few systems, a few jumps of their home system. So they're very, their logistics chain is short. And for those of you who have studied real world wars, um, that's a problem in the real world. And it can be just as much in the Eve world, especially back then when there were far fewer Titans in the game. There's only a handful of them. So getting um, Titans to bridge you everywhere it was a lot harder. A lot harder. Uh, jump bridge networks could be set up. And yeah, as he said, jump bridges don't exist yet. Back then, to move huge amounts of supplies, you actually had convoys of freighters um, that were guarded by a fleet moving through Nullsec, something you basically never see anymore. In Eve. Uh, about the only time you'll ever see that in Eve anymore is when somebody's planting a station egg, and that's about the only time it ever happens. Um, Tar's of the opinion Eve would be better off if there weren't jump freighters and probably if there weren't jump bridges or Titan bridges, but those are different discussions. Um, eventually, the tide does turn against. Um, Bob and MC, again, all the mechanical reasons why TAR isn't 100% sure of. Um, the logistics chains are part of it. Uh, um, TAR believes that another part of it were the changes they made to Titan Mechanic in summer of 2007. Um, Bob definitely heavily relied on its Titans and Shrike and her avatar as one of their major weapons of war and one of the ways they controlled opposing fleets that were much larger than them. Um, not sure of the exact chronology of when this happens, but there is a point in time, um, against all authorities and IAC still hold Ketch and, or was IAC, they weren't, were they also in Ketch along with AAA? Um, they still hold that, so they're kind of this bubble inside of the Bob Empire, which allows them to poke at it. Um, Bob does a campaign along with MC, and they open up a front in Catch trying to crush IAC. Um, that 
ends up failing in the end, but one of the important things that happens to Mercenary Coalition, and Iredelth probably knows more details than Tar, um, MC loses their first Titan. Um, it's lost to a triple A uh, against all authorities trap. They did it. It was a beautifully done trap. Um, against all authorities knows which Titan they want to kill. They know what damage type its DD does, and they build a Dictor that can survive one of those DDs. And it was a super expensive Dictor with its fittings. But it means the Titan DDs a AAA fleet, and the AAA fleet dies, but not the Dictor. The Dictor is able to bubble the um, the Dictor is able to bubble the MC uh, Titan, and then they're able to open up a Sino, bring in a capital fleet more Dictors, and kill the MC Titan. And that's a pretty major blow to uh, Mercenary Coalition at the time. Um, they had not had Titan very long. It had been a lot of effort build. Um, super Capitals and Titans back then are much less common than they are now. Um, Mercenary Coalition's power was great. Mercenary Coalition had a very large capital fleet and a pretty strong Super Cap fleet, especially uh, Super Carriers. Well, what we now call super carriers back then called motherships, which were much more powerful than they would be in 2008, 2009, and in many ways much more powerful than they are now. Um, and so fighter bombers don't exist, but they could fighter swarms were quite devastating at the time. Uh, I think this causes... Um, this causes problems within, uh, yeah, fighter bombing meant something completely different back then. That was a tactic of assigning all your fighters to um, one ship, one or two ships, and then having that ship attack somebody. Uh, so usually a small, fast ship that was hard to hit and hard to kill. And then the fighters just followed whatever that ship attacked, and suddenly you had 20 fighters re fielded by an interceptor while the... Um, carrier or super carrier mothership was somewhere else in system, nice and safe. And the interceptor was the one who all the fighters were following around. Um, Mercenary Coalition kind of withdraws from active fighting at this point. There are, um, apparently there are disputes between the MC leadership and the Bob leadership. Um, Mercenary Coalition doesn't uh, there are definitely people within Mercenary Coalition who think that they're losing um, the mercenary part. They're, they've been working for Bob for months now. Jeez, I think something like seven or nine months by this point. And they're pretty much now seen by much of Eve as um, Bob pets. Uh, there's also a concern that even if their contract ends with Bob, nobody will hire them because everybody thinks they're Bob pets. And so how can you be a mercenary alliance if you can only have one employer because nobody else will hire you because everybody thinks you work for Bob? Um, this leads to um, something that Tar will get to in a moment. Because I believe if Tar remembers the chronology right, and Eredolf will probably be able to correct Tar if he's wrong. Um, and there is a video that Tar wants to uh, put out there. Ooh, actually there are two videos. Um, so, so this video, that video is totally worth watching. It's about 10 minutes long. Don't watch it right now. Um, it is hilarious if you know the events of the time. It's a little harder to appreciate the humor if you don't know the history. Hopefully Tara is giving you some of it. Um, it is a video done from Bob's point of view. It's done for the Bob Alliance leader's birthday, uh, Sir Mole. Um and it's video of fighting, but it's got a story to it. So it's not just one fight. It's clips from a whole bunch of different fights. Um, but there's very much a story that goes with it. There's text in that story and an absolutely hilariously horrible 
um, song uh, about not fighting in null six. So you should definitely watch that sometime. It's uh, pretty funny. Um, and it's got a pretty good soundtrack too. So um, including that hilariously horrible song uh, about null six space. And you'll see from that that fleet fights were a lot smaller back then. Large fleet fights were 200, maybe 300. Um, the servers didn't like it when you went over 300. And one of the ways, honestly, one of the ways Bob was able to fight back then against much larger numbers is Bob FCs understood the server mechanics and they understood what happened when you brought a huge number of people onto the node. Um, and so you could then. Uh, do things to counter it. And yes, there were Bob FCs that would pull out a stopwatch, figure out how long the delay was between inputting a command and it actually happening, and then based on that, they now know the delay, and then they would build that into all their actions in the fleet because they now knew that the command they gave to the pilots to execute would take that amount of time to actually happen. And you then FC that way. Um, and to a certain extent, you still have that with um, uh, time dilation. Time dilation works quite differently, very differently, but you still take it into account in how you're commanding your fleet and how you're doing things. And Bob did, and that helped, it helped knowing how the server mechanics will behave. Um, as Tyra mentioned, Bob was in the fall of 2007. Bob is pushed back, um, Goon Swarm and Red Alliance, IAC, and against all authorities are making a lot of progress in the south. Uh, Mercenary Coalition is pulled out of the north, and the different Bob allies slash pets um, that were put up in the north are being crushed by Razor and um, and what would become known as the Northern Coalition is beginning to form up in the north. So Bob ends up withdrawing from the south. They pull out of the ASCN space they conquered during the ASCN war, um, and they bring the allies that are still standing with them with them into what is called Fortress Delve, um, the Fortress of Fountain, Delve, Quirius, and... Um, uh, Paragon, not Paragon Soul, period basis. They might even have pulled out a fountain. I, uh, maybe Keldun or Aerodalth remembers if they pulled out a fountain or a fountain was just taken from them. Um, but there's a video for that as well. Uh, that video is called... Um, called Vacuum, and it is a Bob point of view on the withdrawal orders, and it's kind of their Bob's PR statement of how the withdrawal happens. Um, the video is actually done by a professional video guy who is in evolution. He's long since been inactive. That that was one of his last major video projects. Um, but in early Eve, he did some pretty neat uh, video projects. Um, and all that video was done with out of game rendering systems because the Eve game engine wasn't nearly as pretty as it is today, nor did it perform nearly as well. And yes, that is uh, Sir Mole's uh, voice giving the evacuation orders. This starts what is known as Delve War Two or the uh, Delve War One, sorry, or the Siege of Delve. Um, a lot of people fighting on the Bob side, and as Tar understands it, a lot of people fighting on the opposing side too. Remembered as one of the high points of their uh, time in Nullsec Wars. Basically, you would have two to three months of daily fleet fights. Um, constant fighting, especially when uh, Goon Swarm and Red Alliance finally were able to crack open um, one of the systems in Quirius. They were able to get the Sino Jammer down and bring in their cap fleet. And then from Quirius, they could begin hitting Delve. Um, so that was a really big deal when they finally cracked open that system. Um, that system had been fought over for weeks before they finally cracked it. 
and then the 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 flood came in um during this time period um happened what tar's going to call the uh, mercenary coalition backstab with the backstabbing quote marks that was what bob called it um some people see it differently um but basically mercenary coalition decides um that they're done with their bob contract um and they're going to try and establish them as a separate entity not a bob pet break the perception that they are bob pets and they want to set themselves up as being separate uh they form with a couple of other mercenary inclined um alliances uh kia being one of them uh what was another one of them uh Starts with an O, but can't remember who they were. I think there were four alliances and three alliances in addition to Mercenary Coalition, and they form a uh, um, they form a coalition called uh, Tort Tortuga Tortuga. Um, their idea being that it will be a group of mercenary alliances that are not strongly tied together you hire each one individually but they will defend one another's soft space so that they can build super capitals in that soft space um from bob's point of view this would have all been fine except as part of this mercenary coalition claims period basis as their own taking it from bob um Bob did not see that as fine. It's one thing to have end the contract and leave. It was another thing to see, to um, seize Bob Sov space as part of your payment uh, for leaving. So Bob definitely sees this as a backstab, especially since it happens at the height of the Siege of Delve when three quarters of Aviv is banging on Bob's doors to try and take their Sov space. Um, Mercenary Coalition basically takes period basis. Bob is not in a position to defend uh, period basis against them. Um, Mercenary Coalition tries to establish themselves as being independent of both sides and go, hey, we're no longer involved in the war. We're now a neutral party. We want nothing to do with this. Just leave us in our little corner. Um, That doesn't really work out in the long run for them. Um, as the siege of Delve goes on, two things become clear to Mercenary Coalition. I guess if he's got the Tortuga um, URL, that's worth looking at sometime. Tar has that video saved on his computer, but he didn't have the URL for it saved. Um, Mercenary Coalition runs into a long-term problem. The opponents of Bob still don't trust Mercenary Coalition and have pretty much stated once they're done with Bob, they'll come kill Mercenary Coalition. And Bob has made it very clear that if Bob wins, they are are going to crush Mercenary Coalition. And in the end, kind of half-heartedly, Mercenary Coalition ends up having to throw their weight behind uh, Goons and Red Alliance, hoping to guarantee that um, Bob doesn't survive and maybe get Goons and Red Alliance not um, come for Mercenary Coalition after the war ends. And Tar will let Erdolf uh, speak because he knows the MC side of things better than Tar does. Tar's just from what he's gathered from the forums. Yeah, I mean, internally it was interesting because um, we had that exact problem. Bob was on one side, Goon's right on the other. We didn't really have any way of getting out of that. And we just weren't backing on Bo- on Bob surviving that. So there was a, long, a lot of uh, diplomacy, a lot of negotiation to kind of just work out, instead of it being a contract, basically uh, a tenuous alliance between Goons and, uh, and Tortuga, uh, mostly MC. The other groups were just followed MC at that point. And just kind of went, okay, well, as long as we help you, maybe you don't shoot us. And this is where the end of the story will get Mercenary Coalition in a lot of trouble. Uh, 
Eventually, uh, the Goon and Red Swarm Northern Coalition, so uh, Morsis Mihi and um, uh, Razor are definitely down here. And Tar has forgotten to mention somebody who's kind of important. Um, during the Great War, pretty much the fall of the Great War, is the birth of Pandemic Legion. Uh, Pandemic Legion is founded as a group of guerrilla-style fighters who wander around Delve, trying to kill Bob Ratters um, and rondering around Fountain. And that's kind of how they get their start. Um, they're seen as a inside, not quite fifth column because they're not part of Bob, but the idea of they wander around and hurt Bob's revenue um, and pull forces off of the front being the idea. Honestly, at the time, Bob doesn't see them as any more than an annoyance. Um, but this is where Pandemic Legion gets their start, and as part of this huge conflict in the Siege of Delve, uh. Pandemic Legion ends up taking Sov in portions of Fountain, and this will be the beginning of the rise of Pandemic Legion. Um, so that's an important outcome of this war, that they were born and that they begin to grow at the end of it. And it's also where they have this long-standing Sometimes very strained, not always fun, not always friendly, but a long-standing relationship with Goon Swarm. Uh, again, not saying they're allies per se. They certainly were in the this war. Um, but they certainly have long-standing ties with uh, Goon Swarm and Goon uh, Alliance leaders. And even if you're not allies, having ties, knowing one another, and being able to talk to one another influences politics a lot, both in the real world and in EVE. Eventually, Goon Swarm and Red Alliance um, make are able to crack open Knoll. Knoll is the spiritual um, capital and home of Bob Alliance. Um, they actually don't have a whole heck of a lot of the stuff there, um, but that is kind of that's the, what everybody sees as the capital of the Bob Empire. That's the heart of the Bob Empire. And so Goon Swarm and Red Alliance and their allies make a dash to crush um, to take Knoll. Um, and this is I think they're probably two months into the fight for Delve at this point. As Tar mentioned, there are fights daily. Bob is using their jump bridge network to fight a fleet battle on over in Quirius. Then two hours later, be up in Fountain fighting up there. Um, they're all bouncing all over the map to defend all the entrance points to um, their regions and push back the invading the invading fleets. Um, and a lot of, as Tar said, for a lot of Bob pilots, this is the height of their experience in EVE because it's what they've wanted for years. Opponents who are strong, who are trying to kill them, and will do anything to kill them. So they have constant fighting. Um, and Tar, at this point in time, was reading all this on the forums, really, 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 really wishing that there was a Mac E plant. Um, so... Um, they make their break into Null, they bring the Sino Jammer down, they jump their capitals in, and um, the siege, the, they try and take Sov in Null. Uh, basically, I think that turned into five days of constant fleet fights. You could basically log into the game, hop in a fleet, and unlock or take a jump bridge, and you would go straight into a fleet fight because the fleet fight stayed on constantly for nearly five days fighting in Null. Um, it ends... Whoa, somebody else... Hot mic. Does somebody else want to talk? Anyone? Okay. Um, it ends with Bob baiting uh, the triple A Titan Ort um into dd and was it a hicks exist in the game by this point right let me tar has that article he read that neat he read that two days ago and he can't remember what the answer was because it was an evolution pilot Oh, come on. Where was it? Tar had the thread open. Uh, 
Unfortunately, TAR can't link you this story because it's an internal one on one of the forums TAR has access to. Uh, so you can't just link it, but it's a um, an account of a evolution member who was there about that, the uh, death of Ort's Titan. Ah, here we are. What is Tarn? Let's go. The Alamo. Um, this would be... Oh, jeez, that's a bit later than Tarn thought it was. Um, the Alamo is, uh, the, in February of 2008. Um, and they have a... Okay, um, Goon Swarm uh, or Goon Swarm or Red Alliance. Actually, it says Goons have a bait carrier, a deep safe spot, which Bob probes down, realizes it's probably bait. They warp their fleet to the carrier. They also warp in uh, DD proof um, heavy dictors, as they expect. Um, two hostile Titans, D Cloak and DD. Um, a lot of the fleet is killed, but that was actually only half of the Bob fleet that was on the field at the time. So a lot of those die as a sacrifice, but the Hitlers survive, and they race over to one of the Leviathans, Orts. They are able to point him. The other half of the fleet comes in, and then um, people, of course, reship, and Orts Titan is killed. Um, we're now at, like... Titan kill number five in the Eve history. Um, we might be up as high as six, so it's still a really big deal when a Titan. I mean, a really big deal when a Titan dies, and that pretty much ends. <coughs> that pretty much ends. Um, Delve War One or the Siege of Delve and Tars throat. Excuse me. Um, that pretty much ends the Siege of Delve. Um, a lot, lot of the Alliance, not Goon Swarm, and only half-heartedly Red, uh, Red Alliance stick around, but pretty much all the other major alliances are like, ah, uh, we're done. this has been expensive enough. We've gotten our vengeance. Uh, we're going, we're going home. So Razor and Morsis Mihi basically pull out and head back north. Um... Goons stick around holding on to the space they've taken from Bob in uh, Quirius. Red Alliance, for the most part, pulls out. And the fighting really quiets down. Uh, within a couple of weeks, Bob launches an offensive, drives Goons out of Quirius entirely. They leave, and this is intentionally done, they leave Fountain alone. They leave a Pandemic Legion and Fountain and do not try and purge them. Instead. Uh, Bob turns towards period basis and mercenary coalition because it's time for vengeance. And from Bob's point of view, it's very much a vengeance campaign. Coalition, and again, Erdolf can speak to this somewhat better than can on the inside of MC. Uh, um, mercenary coalition basically doesn't resist. Um, they basically evac all their stuff and Bob steamrolls period basis. Um, Tortuga implodes, the different alliances that were members of it go their separate ways, and Mercenary Coalition itself implodes with its different corps going different directions and the alliance pretty much coming to an end. Um, and Tar will wait a moment and see if Iridolf wants to add anything to that. Yeah, uh, I think as this was coming down, the same problems that happened earlier in MC's life, because it was a coalition, it was never interested in owning space, but Tortuga was an attempt to kind of rectify the whole, uh, you're only Bob Pets. Um, and what ended up happening is, for the most part, no one had any interest in actually maintaining the that space, because most of the groups were mercenaries. They wanted to go out, get contracts, do stuff. My own corporation took out three, four contracts right in the middle of all the fighting. We were off in the south for like two weeks taking out posses um, while all this war is happening. And then we would just, you know, 
Sino back or make our way back, basically. And so, yeah, it basically, people kind of gave up. They're like, there's really no reason for us to hold on to the space. And when Bob came in, it made the decision super easy. If Bob's coming, well, we'll all just go somewhere else. Um, the one thing that Tara will make clear, something about soft space and why it was especially important back then, in a way that honestly it isn't anymore. Um, soft space was important back then because it was the only place you could build super caps. And back then you basically couldn't buy them on the market. You basically had to build them internally because people, there were so few of them in the game. There were so few resources and production facilities for them that you built them internally and you didn't sell them to outsiders. Um, that would change over the course of 2008 and especially in 2009. But when you're talking 2006 and 2007, super capitals are rare and they're almost always built internally. And so you needed soft space to be able to build those. Especially Titans with their area effect doomsday and their ability to remove an entire fleet from the game in 15 seconds. Um, no matter how big that subcapital fleet was, that's really, really important uh, if you want to be a major null sec power. Um, so that kind of ends um, Delve War 1. Uh, Tar did forget one important story from Delve War 1 from very early in it, and it's part of the implosion, not Delve War 1, the Great War, uh, so the War of 2007, and it's part of the reason why D2 begins to implode. And that is the death in Fountain um, of D2's Titan. It's the third Titan killed in the game. Um, again, this is before Dictor Bubbles um, affect Titans. It's before Hicks exist. Um, and again, it's Bob who does it. They kill the D2 Titan, and they use aggression mechanics. Um, they have set up a plot um, to use a spy character to aggress... A, a titan um, to force it to stay in space uh, when it doesn't have when it goes off to its safe spot to park because at the time titans didn't park in pauses I think that was for pause mechanic reasons back then um, they always parked it, they always logged off at a safe spot and um, the idea was that they would be able to probe down the safe spot, get to it, and then use bump mechanics, etc. once the pilot realized what was happening um, and logged back in um, to kill it. And it actually went off a heck of a lot better than Bob expected it to. They did not notice, the pilot did not notice that he had been arrested. Um, and so he logged out and didn't stay on comms and didn't come back to game. And so Bob was able to... Uh, probe down his logged off Titan, warp to it, Sino, and kill it. I think he did find out from his um, fleet members when local spikes and a whole bunch of Bob come into system, and they're like, wait a minute, and they still see the Titan on scan. Um, so I think he did log in to see himself die, um, unlike Sivok, who didn't log back in before he died. He, he, he wasn't even at the computer when he died, as Tar understands it. Um, but yeah, that's just the third Titan death in the game. Um, that, I think that happened somewhere in the like March-April time frame of 2007. And it's part of the reason why D2 began to implode. Because again, losing a Titan back then was a really big deal. Um, that kind of brings us up to the end of the Great War. We're almost, we're up to an hour and 40 minutes in. I uh, don't think Tar's going to go on into the Max campaign of 2008. Tar's really familiar with the Max campaign of 2008 because he was there for the whole thing. Um, and then Delve War II, which happens in um, February through June of 2009. But if um, people are interested, uh, they'll just have to invite Tar back to talk again. If you've noticed, Tar can talk a lot. That's not a compliment. So questions, comments, queries, insults, uh, challenges to something Tar has said, because there are definitely people who disagree with some of the things Tar has said. Um, as Tar said, there are different points of view on this stuff. I do want to make one point of clarification. 
Um, you had said earlier that uh, MC would often leave space. Actually, MC was renting a bit of space from Bob in return for the continued uh, contract. And, right, and, and part of the contract was right, that right. they gave um, MC got some soft space down in period basis as part of the their contract so they could build the supers again you always did it internally um right, right what caused the problem was when mercenary coalition ended that contract they one kept those systems and took all the neighboring ones yep <laughs> um, other thing um that tar is going to post this is an amazing video done by somebody who tar thinks now works from ccp or at least did for a while um, this is an RKK video done during Delve War One. It's a very defiant video. It's basically, um, we can take it, bring it, we will hold Delve, Delve will not fall. Um, and the composition of the video, the music of the video, it all re- and the imagery. Again, it's a speak to that video. That video, guys. Um, skill, um, how well the video works for that message. Again, whether you agree with the message or not, Tar is staying out of, but again, it's a very well-built one. He does admit that there's basically no fighting in that video. It's pretty much all pos shoots because he goes, at the time, um, you basically couldn't have any pretty turned on for a fleet fight because, uh, yeah, your, your client probably couldn't keep, or at least his client couldn't keep up and the servers couldn't. So he goes, yeah, you can't really get good video of big fleet fights. So pretty much all the video shots in there are of post shoots. Even if your client could take it, you didn't want to turn it on because you didn't want to risk that you'd get one spike at the crucial moment. Yep. Uh, so let's tar scroll back through a couple of things. Uh... Uh, why the huge differences between back then and nowadays? Well, um, lots of things change. Um, a lot of mechanics have changed. Titans don't work the same way. Honestly, one of the biggest things that affected EVE, and something that CCP did not take into account at all, is our ability, uh, us as players, ability to greatly expand the size of the economy. As more people came into the game, as we figured out better way to mine resources, we figured out better ways to move them around, as CCP made new tools like jump freighters available for moving stuff around, um, the economy expanded massively. And this meant there were a, a much larger economy means something that used to be very expensive to produce. Well, that amount of resources, that same amount of resources, isn't that expensive anymore because the economy is so much larger. So super capitals went from being an immense wide effort build a single super to it being possible for a single player with four accounts to build a super. Um, and that completely changes how many supers are in the game, and suddenly you go from having a grand total of six titans in the entire Nullsec to there being more like 300 titans in all of Nullsec. Um, fleet battles in 2009 were basically decided, the, the large fleet battles between major Nullsec powers were decided by who, whichever fleet could bubble the opposing fleet with lots of Dictor bubbles, and then warp in three Titans and DDE the fleet to wipe it all out. That's how basically every major fleet fight ended, was with three Titan doomsdays that killed all the ships on the field. Um, it got to the point by the end of Delve War II, purely for demonstration purposes, um, the alliance of, uh, the coalition of alliances that were fighting Bob in Delve War II, which again, doesn't enter into this history lesson, um, put a carrier on the field and then killed it only with Titan Doomsdays to prove that they had gotten enough Titans together in a coalition that they could basically remove any capital fleet from the game in seconds by just warping enough to all the capitals on the field while hitting their Doomsday. It was pretty much that point that CCP figured out they had to change how Titans worked. And about eight months... 
No, about six months later, they changed the Titan Doomsday from area. Later, they changed the Titan Doomsday from area of effect to the B- anti-capital beam weapon that we know now. So actually, back then, it could hit. You could shoot a subcapital with the beam as well. Um, they've changed a lot of other mechanics. Uh, one thing that has changed massively and was not tr- no, it was not the case back then. Almost all fleets back then were not most all fleets. One of the distinct fleet styles, and it was this fleet style that Bob almost always flew, were sniper battleships. Battleships that could fight out at about 200 to 250 kilometers away. Um, Tar will get out of all the tactical reasons and advantages that has. Um, sniper fleets, by the way, are awesome. Uh, back then, uh, they were a lot of fun. You did not have instant probing. The probing system did not work the way it does now at all that was all changed in uh, December of 2009. So you couldn't probe down the opposing fleet and then warp in on them. So you could maintain range. And if you wanted to warp in on somebody, you had to have small ships, generally interceptors, burn across 200 kilometers of space to be in the middle of the fleet, and then you warp that. And that um, Tars, if you go look at Tar. Palantir 1's kill board. That's what Tar Palantir is. He's an interceptor pilot, and that was some of the most fun he's ever had in the game, was burning across 200, 250 kilometers of open space with half the enemy fleet trying to kill him as he flew in. And his only goal was to get to the middle of the enemy fleet before he died, because his FC could either warp could warp to his pod or warp to his wreck. And that was all that mattered. Um, or, maybe not the fleet, but the dictors could. Um, honestly, that was a lot more fun than what we have now with the probing system. Uh, where basically a cloaked ship that cannot be killed because he's cloaked um, and may not and is somewhere off on grid has already deployed probes and he can probe your fleet down in about 10 seconds, um, which is the reason why nobody fights at 200 kilometers anymore. So yeah, there's just a lot of um, changes in the game mechanics that have happened. Um, the other thing, honestly, with the proliferation of Titans and the proliferation of jump freighters and the proliferation of jump bridges and jump bridge networks, the game is effectively much smaller. It's much easier to move around the map quickly. And so coalitions make a lot more sense because you can be a major power like Goon Swarm that lives in death, but you can defend um, holdings in Geminate without any problems. Uh, current soft mechanics, which replaced the old POS system, again, a change in 2009, made it much, much, much easier to hold together a huge empire. Um, there's a lot of us who wish the old POS, the old POS mechanics, while painful for the POS fuelers, we'll never deny that, but for the game, the POS mechanics were a lot better um, than the current soft mechanics because it provided a lot more options for attacking an opponent. And again, we're not going to get Tar's not going to get into the details, um, and it made it much harder for a large power like Goon Swarm or like AAA or Solar Fleet or Test to hold basically absentee like landlord where they can hold multiple regions, and they've got seven days to come defend it if anybody bothers to attack it. Um, with the old POS system, you had two days to save your system. Um, because if your opponent right, they attacked all your pauses in one day, they reinforced them all, and you had to be there to defend them. Um, or you would lose SOV in that system. Uh, the POS system had lots of us TARS, not saying it was the, the best system, but it was better than what we have now. And yes, that um, I Was There video, if you ever go watch that, that video is based on what used to happen prior to, 2000 and, um, prior to 2010. How you got a warp in on an enemy fleet was you burned through space to do it. And that's a lot more fun for the pilots, for all of the pilots involved. It gives the interceptors a role. It gives them an importance. Um, and it gives the defender... Uh, something to do. You can prevent a warp in because you have anti support ships, snipe zealots, snipe munins, battle cruisers, whose job is to kill incoming dictors, incoming interceptors when they're still 80 kilometers out so that they don't get bubbles on your fleet and they don't get a warp in on top of you. 
And yeah, that's a big Spock split. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, collision damage is never going to happen, and it's really a good thing that it doesn't. Just imagine how badly we as players would um, manipulate that. And then, honestly, another thing that helped out the large um, fleet stuff and the large coalitions um, that we now see, which are far larger than what they were in 2007 or 2008, um, is uh, time, time dilation and the server performance. Um, server performance really goes up in the fall of 2008 um, due to being implemented. Again, we'll stay out of all that. But as the servers can handle more people, you can bring larger groups of pe people with your fleet. And numbers matter in EVE, and especially when the servers can handle those larger numbers. So it benefits you get together more friends so that you can bring the larger fleet. Well, when the server performance doesn't allow more than 300, 400 people to be involved, there's no reason to have 1,200 people in your fleet because only 400 of them can even get in fight because the servers just won't hold anymore. So as the server performance increases, the fleet fights increase, and it makes it more and more beneficial for you to have huge numbers of players. So history questions. Tar doesn't really want to get onto a commentary about modern EVE mechanics, more about the history and maybe how we got to where we are today, but... So, no questions, commentary, insults? Come on, somebody has to degree, want at least be pissed off at what Tar said. Oh, we can get into a whole uh, MC Bob thing if you really want. <laughs> yeah, no, Just different points of view, obviously. That's the reason why Tar does say backstabbing quotes. From Bob's point of view, it was a backstab. Mercenary Coalition... They were making political calculations um, because, yeah, they were looking at the destruction and what they wanted from him and were trying to figure out a way to salvage it. Personally, I think they would have been better off ending the contract but giving up the solve space and just accepting that as part of the price. But um, there might, Tar assumes there were strong reasons for not doing that. Yeah, we needed the space, and it was just the argument of uh, why give it up at that point. Yeah. And that is because you make a very bad enemy. Well, like, it's a gamble. Yeah. We, well, we yeah. took a gamble that it would, uh, it would would go against Bob. Yep. For better or for worse. It was fun, no matter what you said. That was easily, easily the most fun I've had in... Uh, in EVE, in terms of just Chaos Wars. Yeah. I've had so many fights that were just purely ridiculous, like, no reason that fight should happen. One, and that was one of the things that Tar mentioned, is that even from Bob's point of view, that time period was an awesome time to be playing the game, because it was what Bob wanted, and again, he says this, which is fine, but what Bob had been trying since summer of 2006 was to get major powers to fight them, to to be so afraid that instead of cowering, they lashed out so that Bob would get the wars they wanted. Um, and I won't say every member of Bob was after that, because again, people are different, but it's definitely what the Bob leadership was after. And they got that war, and that was a lot of fun um, for all involved. Oh yeah, I definitely, there was, uh, there was a point when a giant Bob fleet, oh, okay, I guess for that time it was big, but a Bob fleet of, I think, around 80, just took ships from cruiser size down, and entered, uh, you know, basically the space that MC had claimed at that point, 
And it was hilarious because they came in through six large bubbles, and it was just a stint, constant, oh, look, there's another ship, pop, pod. There's another ship, pop, pod. And it was clear, like, that was not a serious fight in any way, but it was just so much fun. I hope it wasn't serious anyway. No, I'm pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> Bob, you know, Bob was capable of wheeling significantly more... Um, Oh, absolutely. Dangerous fleets. And when, as we talked about earlier, when Bob, did, they put they put MC down on the list to be dealt with later, but they focused on Goon Swarm, Red Alliance, since Morsis Me, he's a pandemic leader who were invading Delve and Quirius. And once they were done with those, they turned for MC. So... MC was bound to MC and Tortuga were going to fail no matter who won. Yeah, that was they were kind of stu- and that's where they're not sure if it would have worked out better, but um, one other alternative, which I think you guys discussed internally, was basically giving up the Sov space and moving elsewhere in Eve and trying to set up your independence of both sides. But the question kind of came: Would Eve that was currently fighting Bob ever hire you. Yeah, it's kind of why MC fell apart too, because we're like, it, it kind of came to the decision that there's a good chance that no matter how this goes, a mercenary coalition as it exists won't work. Um, and at the end of the day, the individual corporations were getting their contracts anyway. It's not like because of MC, everything had fallen apart. It's just we weren't getting MC contracts anymore. Right, you could get court contracts, but not uh, Merc- Alliance level. Yeah, and uh, like I said, my corp spent a good two, three weeks in the middle of all the fighting, just kind of ignoring it and going off doing our own contracts. Um, it looks like we've pretty much ended it up. Uh, I'm not seeing any new questions. Yeah, I think for old Bogies like us, we could just sit here discussing this all day. Yeah, and that's not really where Tar's wanting to go. And honestly, you could have you could have better discussions with some of the old fogies that are still around and um, oh, evolution. absolutely. Oh, absolutely. This targets a lot of this from just talking to those people. As Tar's mentioned, all the stuff he talked about, he was not he did not see firsthand in the sense of he wasn't playing. But Tar has um, Tar's academic background is actually in. Um, Major in history, minors in political science, sociology, and anthropology. Um, so he, he studies human behavior, and he loves studying Eve because of um, uh, you can see a lot of that human behavior and how the social structures and the political and all the rest of it, and the rivalries. There's no question that personalities matter in Eve. Um, and you can see how that also then would play into, yes, there's real politique, but there's also personalities. And even if it's not in your best interest, sometimes you work with a group of people because you get along with them well. Uh, so humans are humans. So it's really interesting to look at that behavior. And so Tar followed it for two years via forums and players. Again, he had a friend, uh, that friend who was in um, ASCN R- and the corporation R's uh, uh, Celestia. Ours would leave oh, ours, ours, ours. Yes, when our, when yes. SCN imploded, ours would go looking for a new home, and they would end end up in um, Goon Swarm, and they're still in Goon Swarm to this day. Different corp name. They had a corp, uh, a CEO based corp theft, so they had to found a new corporation, ours ex Discordia. Um, ah, and there's uh, Keldon started in ours. Uh, so, yeah, um, Tar knew a guy. Dr. Norton uh, was a real-life friend of Tar. He was actually a co worker And Tar has another real-life friend that he's known far longer than Eve has existed. Um, actually, about twice as long as Eve has existed. Um, who was a founding member of Evolution. So, yeah, taught to hear about uh, the ASCN war and the Great War from both sides, from real-world friends, and then reading all the forums. Coad was a, a must-read back then. And then uh, Scrap Heap 
Heap Challenge when it came out. And Eve Tribune, too. Eve Tribune back in 2006-2007 was pretty good. Yeah, I hope those URLs um, are useful to people and you find them interesting to read. Oh, crud, we didn't talk about FTAC-T. I feel horrible. Oh, my God, how could one forget FTAC-T? <laughs> Well, I think based on the responses to this, if you're willing to come back at any point, I think people yeah, would love to have you. Yeah, you will revisit FTAC TE. Um, yeah, that's a really big deal and one of the best stories in EVE. But the advantage of not having talked about it is, while Tar has those saved, um, the forum posts about that event, he doesn't have the URLs, so he'll go looking for the URLs so that he can share them with people. And yes, Tar can um, come talk again if uh, you guys want to arrange it. You just use Bracco to do so. Tar talks too much, as you've already seen. No, that's right. Anytime uh, some of the older players get onto the Uni Mumble and we're all there, it pretty much turns into back in our day. Well, there's things. Tar's not even one of those old guys, because he just started in 2008. Oh, that's old for this game. I'm getting there. <laughs> and it is true, Tar hasn't taken any um, any major breaks from the game, so he's been through maps, and then the war in the southeast against goons, and then uh, the fall, the uh, disbanding of it and Delve War II, um, the rise of the It Alliance, the reconquest of Fountain, the reconquest of Delve. Max to um, the war in catch against uh, AAA, and then the implosion of uh, it alliance, and then of course Tar's still flying around shooting and killing goons and being killed by goons in 401k, which is where Tar Palantir and Evolution are today. Well, I think everyone should definitely thank Tar for coming on to the point where he even stole Braku's. Uh... <laughs> mumble account so that he could come talk to us. Uh, I definitely enjoyed revisiting my own history, and so I uh, hope everyone else did as well. Yeah, I hope the um the the other old players in there, you guys didn't scream too loudly. So I hope Tar has been <laughs> basically accurate. And of course, there are there are lots of little details that Tar didn't talk about. This was all done in very broad brush strokes, um, so hopefully some of those posts that Tar put in there can give you a little more insight to certain details and certain events that happened. Go back and read those. And um, I don't know how you guys handle posting these things. Um, if you want, Tar can give you all those URLs that you can put into a consolidated post on your forum somewhere. If you don't mind, that'd be fantastic. I'm probably going to force Braku to do it, but if he doesn't get off his ass and do it, I'll do it myself. Okay, Tar can give those all to Braku. He's got Braku in a Jabber Chat channel anyways. Wonderful. It's one less thing for me to do. <laughs> so, um, because, yeah, Tar... The videos he had um, laying around for other reasons, and then um, he went and found some of those old posts. And he's got to go find one of the, that old F the FTEC T post, because that was, yeah... Let's just say it's probably the best April Fool's joke that Eve has ever seen. And we'll just leave it at that. That's actually probably really true. Yeah, Tara's... Yeah, nobody else has pulled off an April Fool's joke like that. Nothing like that. Yeah. Give whoever came up with that. That's some credit. That was well played. And so completely coincidental that they grabbed an opportunity and ran with it. Yeah. Okay, Tar's going to shut up, otherwise he'll keep on rambling. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming by. Um, yeah, I'll definitely poke Braku again, because I think everyone had a good time. Uh, definitely... Obviously, Keldum and I are sitting here going, yes, this and that, and this and that. 
So, and hopefully, the older players get, or younger players get a better appreciation for the game that's developed into what they're playing today. Yeah, there's definitely um, something to keep in the back of your head is that the, the the history. One of the things that makes Eve interesting, and unlike a lot of other games, the history matters. Pandemic Legion was born in this war. They're now one of the dominant alliances in the game, and Tar will never deny that. Um, and you'll see probably the greatest test of Pandemic Legion is the reconquest of Fountain in fall of two thousand and nine. Um, and that they survived that and became what they are today is a credit to them, um, because they that was that was a challenging time for them. Uh, so yeah, the, this matters. And then the players, Keldun's still around, Erdath is around, Tar is still around, Mole's still playing the freaking game for evolution. And his role in the game has changed. The amount of time he puts into it has changed, uh, but he's still there. The Mitanni is still around again. His his role has changed, but he's been playing Eve actively as a major member of Goon Swarm since 2006. And we remember all of this stuff, and we remember what was said and what was done, and that impacts how we behave in the game. So yeah, the history matters in this game. And it's so much fun. The history alone is so chaotic and fun. Uh, one of the things which is interesting about, again, from Tar's historian standpoint, is that you get to see a microcosm of human behavior. You get to see a type of behavior we don't see in the modern world because we now have much more established international structures. Um, and honestly, because our weapons have gotten to the point that we could annihilate the human race if we behaved like we did during the Middle Ages. Um, and then uh, we get it in a context where nobody actually dies, which um, Tar really appreciates because he's not a very violent person and he doesn't believe in hurting people. And he really likes flying a spaceship and blowing other people up. Actually, he doesn't care about blowing people up so much. It's the... Well, that's going off in a soapbox and Tar's going to show up. <laughs> Yeah, that's something that it's not for this, but there's there's something that is nice about that that you can have this challenge, you can have the struggle. Um, there is we all have something to lose because when my ship gets blown up, okay, that actually it's gone. And if you do that often enough to somebody and you destroy their income sources, it really does affect them. But nobody bleeds. Nothing is actually permanent, so you can get that challenge and that PvP, as we call it, experience without actually doing real harm, unlike if you were doing sword fighting. Anyways, Tar's really horrible at fencing. He's tried it a couple of times. Alright, well, just because I don't want to keep you any longer... Um, thank you once again. We will definitely poke Braku about, uh, having you come back. Okay. And otherwise, um, yeah, if no one has any last minute questions, let's, uh, wrap this up. And of course, uh, for any of you who are interested in EVE history, the Uni Public uh, Lounge is, usually has at least two or three older players in, in a given time. And all you need to do is talk about, so what was Eve like a year ago? And, and we will gladly waste the next three hours of your life. And of course, um, Tar, you're welcome onto our, um, for, uh, our mumble anytime you like. Well, he'll have to get registered um, so that he can actually do that. Uh, yeah, just um, you can register for our forums in-game. Super easy, and once you have access to that, You've got our wiki, you've got our mumble, the whole nine yards. All right, Tar, I'll see what he can do. Wonderful. Uh, all right, well, with that, I'm actually going to take my leave and hop up, maybe go do an incursion or something. So I will catch you guys soon.